I'm Temple Grandin. I'm professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Well, the title of the article is um, Can Slaughterhouses Be Made Humane for Cattle, Pigs, and Sheep? And a common question that I get asked by many different people is, do animals know they're going to get slaughtered? And this is a question I wanted to answer very early in my career. And I would go over to the local meat plant, and then I'd go out to a feed yard or a ranch and watch them handle cattle in the veterinary chute. And I found they behaved exactly the same way in both places. If they were afraid of getting slaughtered, they should be much wilder at the plant. And that just wasn't the case. You know, then I started studying things more, and I found they were scared of a lot of little distractions that we tend to not notice. A shadow, it's too dark. A reflection on the floor, a coat on a fence, a hose on the ground. If you remove these distractions, then they would walk up the chute. And the levels of stress that you have uh, going into the meat plant or going up the veterinary chute is about the same. I'm not going to say it's stress-free, but the level of stress at the slaughter plant, when it's run correctly, is the same as the veterinary chute. The article covers uh, animal handling principles and animal stunning methods are covered in detail. And when they are applied correctly, captive bolt stunning will induce instantaneous insensibility. Electrical stunning, when it's done correctly, will induce instantaneous insensibility. And then you also have CO2 stunning for pegs. And unconsciousness is not instantaneous. But when it's done right, pigs have a relatively smooth induction. And one advantage you have in the new CO2 systems is really good handling systems that go along with them. And then the controversial, um, the, then the controversial area of uh, kosher and halal slaughter is also covered. Well, one of the questions I got asked are what are some of the common mistakes that handlers make? Uh, the first of all is just getting animals too excited and scared. That last five minutes during slaughter is very uh, crucial for meat quality. If pigs are all jamming together and squealing, the uh, pH goes down, you're going to have pale, soft, um, watery meat. Toughness and beef can go up if you're poking them with electric prods. The big mistake is they just get animals too excited. Handlers need to calm down. Another really important principle is moving small groups. Bring up small groups of cattle and pigs at a time, and do not jam the crowd pen full. It's extremely important to remove all the little distractions from the facility. Things like reflections on floors, a hose on a fence, a coat on a fence, um, people walking by, moving conveyors. Um, uh, if the chutes are too dark, they won't go in. I call this all the distractions. And I've gone into a plant where I may have to find five or six of these distractions before the animals will move easily. Uh, one plant, I had to block a sunbeam from the roof. I had to cover up a lady who was um, doing cattle IDs. I had to um, light up the entrance of the chute because it was too dark. I had to hang up a curtain so they didn't see people walking by. Until I tracked down all of these things and fixed them, the animals were balking and backing up and didn't want to go up the uh, chute. You know, if animals are constantly backing up or turning around, you need to fix what the problem is, not use more force. Now, vocalization scoring is a really useful method for um, locating really severe bad problems at plants. If somebody's like poking cattle with electric pride, they're going to moo. If the stunner's broken, they're going to be mooing because it's not instantaneous. If, you, if a restraining device is hurting an animal, your animal is going to moo. Vocalizations um, during handling in the stunning chute and in the actual uh, kill box, 99% um, of the time we're associated with something bad. So we use vocalization scoring to prevent plants from doing really bad things. And in order to pass an audit for a large companies such as McDonald's, you're only allowed to have three cattle out of 100 mooing and vocalizing as they enter the slaughter box and in the restrainer itself. Once a plant has been designed right and it's operated right, it's really important to have farmers bringing in animals that, are, that can be handled. You know, some of the worst cattle to handle are cattle that have never seen a man on foot until they come into the plant and then they're freaking out and hitting the walls because it's the first time they saw a man on foot because they've been handled on horseback before. The man on foot, scary and new. Cattle need to be trained to both the man on foot and the man on horse before they come to a plant. Pigs differentiate between a person in the alleyway and a person in the pen. It's very important that people walk through the pens before the pigs are shipped to get them used to people walking through them. So getting, people, getting animals accustomed to people walking through them that's extremely important. Also, dairy uh, producers need to bring cattle in when they're still fit to travel. 
you know, a lot of problems that have happened, and there's some very bad videos out on the internet. Half of that problem was caused by dairies bringing in half-dead old cows. You need to bring cows in when they're still fit for transport. Uh, other problems I've seen are um, fatigued pigs. We've grown pigs to be very large, very muscular. Some of these pigs are weak. And unless producers are very careful with feed additives such as beta agonists, ractopamine, and sulpanerol, you can get lameness, weak animals, and muscle stiffness, and uh, heat stress uh, problems. I've you got to give me an animal that I can handle at the plant. It's got to not be weak, wild and crazy, stiff, sore, or heat stressed. One of the most important things in captive bolt stunning is maintenance of the equipment. When I did my original baseline surveys for developing auditing programs, the number one cause of failure of captive bolt was failure to maintain the guns. They require a lot of maintenance. This tool has to hit really hard, and if you don't take it apart every day and clean it and replace parts as needed, uh, it's not going to work. Now, electric stunning, you have to make sure you place it on the head in the correct position so the electricity will go through the brain and cause a grand mal epileptic seizure. That's what makes it induce the insensibility. And if you put it back on the neck and it does not go through the, um, the brain, uh, then all you're going to do is to t torture the pig. So one of the things that they're audited for is placement of the electrodes in the correct position. CO2 stunning, you need to have for pigs. You need to have a high concentration of CO2, 80 to 90 percent. There are genetic differences in how pigs react to CO2. Most pigs have a good reaction. There are some genetic types of pigs that have a bad reaction. Fortunately, most of those bad pigs, at least in the American industry, are, are getting phased out. It, this is something where there actually needs to be a lot more study. But what I've observed is that most pigs, when they go into 90% CO2, they might sniff and back up, and then they fall over, and then after they lose posture, they're unconscious. And then there's some genetic lines. They take one whiff of CO2, and they're screeching, and they're trying to get out. And that's obviously not acceptable. You know, one of the best ways to evaluate any kind of atmospheric uh, stunning method is how does the animal behave before it falls over? Because after it falls over, then it is no longer conscious. Well, if you use captive bolt stunning, the animal should immediately collapse. No rhythmic breathing. When you hang it up, a soft, flaccid tongue. No corneal reflex when you touch the eye. No blinking reflex like, you know, live animals that have out in the yards. Now, when you use um, CO2 or electrical stunning, the they, um, brain is not physically destroyed. See, in captive bolt, you physically destroy the brain with a bolt. Where in electrical and CO2, the brain is not destroyed. So even though the animal's unconscious, there'll be a few that will have a weak corneal reflex if I touch the surface of the eye with a pen. But blinking must be absent, response to a nose prick or a pin on the nose must be absent, no rhythmic breathing, and no natural blinking like live animals out in the yards. And when I train auditors, I take them out in the yards and say, now I want you to see how these cattle and pigs blink because if you ever see that out on the slaughter line, that's a failed audit. And and we have the American Meat Institute uh, Animal Handling Guidelines. You get those on animalhandling.org. And there's a very nice chart there on signs of insensibility for the next, all the different types of stunning. You can also go on grandin.com. And both, um, for both kosher, which is Jewish slaughter, and halal slaughter, which is Muslim slaughter, in the most uh, strict uh, version of it, um, there is no stunning. The throat is cut without stunning. Now you have two animal welfare issues here. How do I hold the animal and the throat cut itself. Now in the U.S., some of the worst problems in the past have been how that animal was held because some plants were taking live cattle and just hanging them up by their ankle. And the live cattle were vocalizing and you had a 100% vocalization score. That's horrible. Well, if you're torturing the animal with the restraint method, then there's no way you can evaluate the throat cut. Now most of our plants uh, today are using much better restraint methods. There is an exemption in the Humane Slaughter Act and exemptions in the regulations where basically religious slaughter is not covered by the Humane Slaughter Act. The Humane Slaughter Act applies before and after it, but not for the religious slaughter itself. And after you hold the animal in a decent restraint device, where you're not um, having it mooing and everything, then you can evaluate the throat cut. And what I have observed is that when you use, when in kosher slaughter, when they use that special long knife, and they do it really, really right, the animal reacts less than if I put my hands on his face like that, he would react more. And if you use a, the wrong kind of knife and don't do the cut right, they react violently. 
and there has been a study from New Zealand that showed that um, you know there was pain, but they were using a knife that might have been too short. Also, they were using a knife that was um, sharpened on a, on a grinder, which would make the blade rough. Um, it, fortunately, in the halal, where you don't have the special knife, they will accept um, a stunning method. You know, stunning method, either electrical or captive bolt and stun right, is instantaneous. Where even under the best conditions, when you cut the throat without stunning, it is not instantaneous. If you use good technique, most cattle will collapse within 30 seconds. Sheep and goats, since they have all their arteries in the front, they'll usually clap, collapse within, you know, anywhere from 8 seconds to 15 seconds. Uh, sheep and goats die more quickly. I think welfare issues uh, during slaughter without stunning are much more of a problem for cattle than they are for sheep and goats, because sheep and goats die quick and they're very easy and small to hold. One of the best ways to evaluate uh, whether or not a plant is uh, doing slaughter in a humane, low-stress manner is numerical objective scoring, where you measure with numbers the really important critical control points. And that would be st effective stunning on the first application, which for cattle would be how many cattle do you put down with the first shot? Make them insensible with the first shot. Pigs it would be, or sheep, how many you placed the electrodes correctly. I can count that. And then I can tell, am I getting better or am I getting worse? Then you would measure vocalization score in the, you know, putting the animals up into the stun box in the uh, slaughter chute itself. Uh, and each animal is scored yes, no. Was it stunned correctly on the first shot? Yes or no. Did it vocalize in the kill box? Yes or no. It's very, very simple. And then you score electric prod use. Was he poked with the electric prod? Yes or no. And that's done all over the whole entire facility. Then you score percentage of animals that fall down during handling all over the entire facility. And then the percentage of animals that are insensible when you hang them up. And that has to be 100%. So that's the five critical control points. Then you have acts of abuse. And if you have an act of abuse, that's an automatic failed audit. Things such as um, uh, beating animals up, dragging uh, non-ambulatory animals that cannot walk, um, uh, running cattle over the top of other cattle on purpose, slamming gates on animals, and poking sensitive areas like the rectum or the eyes. That would be an automatic failed audit. And these scores are outcome measures of bad things. Like there's a lot of different things that can make an animal vocalize. That's why it's such a good score because it measures a multitude of problems. I have found that one of the most effective ways to maintain high standards is when major customers audit and inspect plants. That really motivates plants to change. Now in the last few years the USDA has gotten a lot more strict. Another thing that can really help maintain high standards is video auditing, where video cameras are put in and they're monitored by outside auditors over the internet. Because then this solves the problem of people acting good when someone's watching with a clipboard and acting bad when you're gone. And I have found that handling is very, very prone to you know, people putting on a show. Captive bolt stunning, that's so dependent on maintenance that you know, that the, the video auditing is probably less important for that. Because if you maintain the gun, then things are going to work right. But major customers insisting on change, that's what has, what has made some of the biggest changes I've seen in the industry because I've been in this industry now since the 70s and back in the 80s and the early 90s the industry was absolutely terrible. And then in 1999 I worked on implementing an auditing program for McDonald's Corporation and I saw more change than I had seen in a 25 year career prior to that. The first thing it did is it made them fix all the broken stuff. You used to just go in and you have all this broken stuff, fix all the slippery floors, that kind of stuff they can't put on a show because that stuff they can't fix in the 15 minutes it takes an auditor to put his hat and coat on before he comes out in the plant. But I had a very interesting time taking the executives of large companies um, such as McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King and other retailers on their first trips to farms and slaughter plants. And when things worked right they were f happy about it, but when things were bad they were going, oh, there's some things here we're going to need to improve. It was just like that show Undercover Boss. I saw the boss's eyes get opened up and they go, oh, we got to fix some stuff. And that motivated them.